Father, our prayer tonight is that you would lead us to the cross so that we would know your grace and your mercy that flows from Jesus Christ to us, so that we would know that we are forgiven of all our sins, so that we would be aware of the depth of your love for each and every one of us. Father, tonight, may we see your glory and your truth and your beauty reflected in the cross. Speak to us now, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Luke chapter 9. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, then grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. That's what they're there for. Feel free to use that. Uh, If you need a Bible, uh, feel free to take that. We want you to have the Word of God, use the Word of God, let it be part of your life. Uh, You know, the cross gets in the way. Uh, literally, this cross that we just put up here uh, gets in the way. Gets in the way of where I move. Gets in the way of some of the sight lines. Some of you can't see the words because of it. Uh, and got in the way of the band. All that kind of stuff. The cross gets in the way. Uh, but realize the cross is supposed to get in the way of our lives. The cross is supposed to get in the way of our lives. Uh, the cross interferes with our desires to be blessed with, with health with money, with fame. The cross confronts our craving for comfort, our desire to always feel good. Right? You guys feel good? People say, you feel good? Are you you doing well? We want to feel good. And and, and the cross confronts that, and, and it confronts our appetite for pleasure. The cross shatters our addiction to life especially our lives right now, our physical lives, because the world is so bent on safety. You've got to be safe. You've got to be secure. And the cross just shatters that. Even to those of us who sing about the cross, who, who love the Savior who died on the cross for us, who celebrate the salvation that comes through Jesus' death and resurrection, the cross gets in the way. The cross gets in the way of how we plan our lives. The cross gets in the way of what we want our lives to look like. See, the cross gets in the way. That's how God designed it. You know, the cross was never meant to be a symbol that decorates religious buildings. Never was. It became that, but that's not how how it was originally intended. The cross was never meant to be uh, an item that we wear on our bodies as jewelry or used to decorate our our own persons uh, to make a statement about our faith. That wasn't what it was meant. And, And the cross was intended to offend. Scripture calls Jesus the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The cross gets in the way and the cross represents sacrifice. It represents sacrifice because the cross is designed to disrupt and reorder our shallow, self-centered, unsatisfying lives. That's why God gave it to us, to, to, to reorder who we are. And, and so when we look at the cross, we need to be reminded of sacrifice. First and foremost, we need to be reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Be reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus. The, the cross is to remind you and I that Jesus, the Son of God, died for you, died for me to save us from hell and give us heaven. That, that's the, one of the reminders that, it, that it, it means for me and for you. That's why John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. John 1, John sees Jesus walking and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Jesus, being the Lamb of God, there's two pictures of Old Testament sacrifice. The first one is the scapegoat. You ever hear of a scapegoat? Yeah, you ever been the scapegoat? Yeah, it's no fun, is it? 
That, you know where that imagery came from? In, in the Old Testament, once a year, the, the, the people of Israel, the nation, the congregation, was supposed to take a goat, and, and they symbolically put all of their sin, all their rebellion upon that goat. And then they turned it loose. They cast it out. It was the outcast. And, and it went out into the wilderness to die and to take their sin away. And then there's the picture of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. You guys know about the Passover? It's when, when uh, God was going to set the children of Israel free from slavery in, in Egypt. And, and so he told them all to, to kill a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the doorposts of their house. So that when the death angel came to Egypt, he would pass over their house and they, their lives would be saved by the blood of the lamb. That's the imagery that, that John is using when he says, look at Jesus, he's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the cross reminds us that Jesus is the Lamb of God and that Jesus died for only one reason. That reason is to redeem us. To redeem you and me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Beautiful passage says this. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways uh, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You were redeemed. You were purchased from hell with the blood of Jesus. You see, every one of us, every one of us deserves hell. By the choices that we made, by the sins that we committed, by the rebellion that we entered into, we earned the right to go to hell. And God loved you, loved me enough to send Jesus in this world. And through his death on the cross, he paid the price for our rebellion. That's why we say that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin, all of our sin. That's the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus paid the price to set you free. If you're a follower of Jesus, and by that I mean that if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, if you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sin, and that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus, then understand that Jesus died to set you free. He died to set you free from sin and death and hell. In other words, he paid the price for your eternity so that heaven is yours. He also died to set you free from guilt and shame. He actually died to set you free from religion. Isn't that kind of cool? I mean, because religion is man's efforts to try to appease God. To try to say, God, are we good enough now? It doesn't work. And Jesus' death took that away and said, look, we can live in relationship now. You're reconciled to me and, and, and you're going to be with me as sons and daughters. Not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. So the price he paid was his life. He died so that you and I can live forever. The cross represents and reminds us of the sacrifice of Jesus. I pray that you understand the grace that flows from the cross to you. But it doesn't stop there. The cross also represents our sacrifice for Jesus. Um, you see, the cross is an invitation for us to follow our Savior. Really follow, not just in words, but in actions, with our lives. Isn't that what Jesus said in Luke 9, 23? We just read it a moment ago, but I want you to, I want you to go back to this verse. I, I actually, if I could, I'd have you memorize this verse. This is one of those verses that centers us back on what our purpose is, what our calling really is. Because Jesus said what? And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and come follow me. See, that's the invitation. The cross reminds us what it means to be an active follower of Jesus. See, just a moment ago, we just find what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm guessing most of you in this room already have made that declaration, made that commitment. You see yourselves as followers of Christ. Here's Jesus' test of what it means to actively follow 
him. First of all, we got to deny selfishness. Deny selfishness. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. I don't know if you've noticed, but we live in a self-centered world. Right? And it's filled with self-centered people. I mean, look around you. People are selfish, aren't they? We're selfish, aren't we? I mean, I'm selfish. I know that. I know. I'm a, I really am. I'm a selfish pig. <laughs> I have to just look in the mirror and I go, yep, I'm selfish. Because I want for me what I want. I mean, I want to enjoy. I want comfort. I want pleasure. I want taste. I want to be entertained. I want to be served. That's why I like cruises so much. <laughs> right? You get on the boat, and it's like, hey, we're here to take care of you. And I like that. It's nice. I want my plans. I want my dreams. I want my goals all met. I want what I want. I'm selfish. I'm guessing that you're probably a lot like me. And Jesus simply says, deny your selfish desires. Say no to them. Confront them. Don't give in to the, the craving that you have for you to take care of you. That's what the cross challenges us with. And it's not something you just do once. I was eight years old when I prayed and said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. Eight years old. It's like, okay, I committed myself to Christ. Uh, and I, in, in essence, in that prayer, I died to self. But that doesn't last a lifetime. <laughs> but it didn't last very long at all. <laughs> the salvation does that Jesus gives me. But the dying to self is something I've got to do over and over and over and over again. It's something I need to wake up every day and say, Jesus, I, I, I got to give up my selfishness. I got to repent of my selfishness. And, and sometimes it's something I need to do multiple times throughout the day. Because I have a great capacity to be selfish. Because that's the root of sin, isn't it? Being selfish. Saying, I want what I want rather than what God wants. And so we've got to deny our selfish desires. We've got to kill our self-centeredness and become Jesus-focused. Become God-centered. It's living a life that really says, in essence, Jesus, you're more important than I am. You see, that's what selfishness really is. It's saying that I'm more important than God. What I want is more important than what God wants. And so I'm going to do what I want, not what God wants. And so denying selfishness in you is saying, Jesus, what you want is more important than what I want. Right now and forever. And so whatever way that you're living out selfishness, because we all are, the cross reminds us to repent as a sacrifice for Jesus. Deny yourself. And then the cross reminds us not only to deny ourselves, but to embrace death. Embrace death. For if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily. Um, I almost didn't write embrace death. I, honestly, I thought that was too harsh. And so I wrote down stuff like, Embrace the cross. Embrace the sacrifice as lifestyle. Embrace the priority of Jesus. Embrace the cost of following Jesus. I had all those things written down in my notes and for your notes. And, and then I went back and changed and said, no, Jesus is actually telling us, you and me, that we are to embrace death. Because when he spoke to the crowd of people listening to him, they knew the cross as one thing and one thing only. It was an instrument of torture. It was what the Romans used to execute thousands upon thousands of people. And so when he said, you've got to take up your cross, he was saying to them, hey, you've got to embrace a death sentence. And the people listening were repulsed by the image. They weren't like, oh, yeah, lead me to the cross. No, they're saying, like, get me away from the cross. I'm going to run. I'm going to hide. I don't want anything to do with it because the cross equals death. So what did Jesus mean? How do we embrace death? I mean, it's not like one of those cultic things, you know, uh, where, you know, I'm going to lead us all in group suicide. 
And some of you are like, all right, what's in the communion cups? <laughs> don't worry, 4.30 got out alive, so uh, don't have to fear that. It's not, it's not that. What does Jesus mean? How do we embrace death? It means that we believe Jesus more than we believe anyone else. You know why we want you to read the Bible? Not just to learn cool stuff or, you know, be familiar with the stories that your kids are learning downstairs so you can answer questions. We want you to read the Bible because this is God's Word. This is what God thought was important enough for you and I to have so that we could understand who He is and how He works in this world and how He can change our lives. And if we're going to embrace death, it means we, we actually say, Jesus, I believe you more than anyone else. And, and so I'm going to read this book and study this book and, and let it become part of my life and how I think and how I live. This is, becomes my ethic and, and my instruction manual for life. That's what it means to embrace death. Jesus, I believe you more than anyone else. It also means that we love Jesus more than we love life itself. I mean, we sing about loving Jesus, and we talk about loving Jesus, but it really means that we love Jesus more than we love life. Now, how does that live out? Well, here's one of the ways it lived out in, around me. Uh, we start talking about mission trips. Say, we're going to Albania, we're going to Thailand, we're going to China, we're going to wherever. And, and we invite people to go. And one of the questions people always ask me, is it safe? <laughs> now, I always answer that as best I can, because some trips are safer than others. But uh, what I really want to say is, does it matter? I mean, does it matter? And, and, and see, the problem is, is that we love physical life more than we love Jesus. Because we live in this, you know, culture that craves long lives. And so we, you know, bubble wrap everybody and put a helmet on until they turn 45. Because the thing that we value the most is physical life. And Jesus says, I want you to value me more than you value physical life. And so that means that we're going, okay, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with my life, and I'm going to follow you with my life. And, and if you take my life away, then I'm okay with that because real life is you, and I know that you've got heaven prepared for me, and so I don't have to be afraid of death. Do you know what God does to us so that we eventually love him more than life, or at least helps us get to that point? Do you guys see this in the, in the world around you, what he actually does to, to wean us off of the addiction to this physical life? In case you're missing it, he lets us get old and life starts hurting. <laughs> Have you noticed that? See, and, and, and if you're like me where it doesn't hurt that bad yet, you're kind of like, yeah, I want to go to heaven, just not now. Right? Because we all want to go to heaven, we're just not like eager to get there. Unless you start talking to some of the senior saints who are in a lot of pain day in and day out, and they start kind of going, all right, Jesus, I'm ready. Let's go, because I know it's going to get better, and this life hurts. See, you see it in their eyes when they go, I don't care as much about this world as I do about the world to come. And you see that transition where they love Jesus more than they love life. And here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether you're 18 or 88. That's where Jesus wants us to live to love him more than we love this physical existence in this world. That's what it means to embrace death. Embracing death means that we will live for God. You go, wait, wait embracing death means that we'll live? Yes. If we embrace death, it means that we're going to live for God. It means we're going to give him our time, our energy, our talents. We're going to give him our worship. We're even going to give him our money. That's what it means to embrace death. To follow Jesus. The problem is a lot of us love our money more than we love Jesus. It means to embrace death that we're going to live fearlessly and courageously. And we're going to live fearlessly and courageously because when you know that God will take care of you tomorrow, you have no fear today. You see, if you really believe that God is going to take you to heaven no matter what happens because Jesus is your Savior, because you're following him, because he died on a cross to save you, then you're not afraid of what might happen because you know that God's got it and you know that it's only going to get better and you know that heaven is your home and you know that nothing in this world can separate you from the love of God and so you can live your life without fear. 
You see, embracing death means that we trust Jesus so much that we're going to praise him no matter what happens. Period. I guess to put it simply, the cross means I'm all in for Jesus. I'm all in. I'm not holding anything back. I'm not trying to hedge my bets. I'm putting it all on the table and I'm giving it all to Jesus no matter what. A few weeks ago, uh, when the movie The Son of God came out. Don't know how many of you saw it, but uh, our life group went and saw it together. It's kind of fun because then we got to talk about it afterwards and critique it and everything, all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and actually, I think it's a really good movie. It, understand, when I say it's a really good movie, it's not necessarily biblically accurate at every point. In fact, there's a lot of points where it's not biblically accurate. But they tell the story of the gospel and they communicate the gospel in a really powerful way and a really beautiful way. And so I, I'm for the movie. I think it's a great movie because it really presents Jesus as the Son of God and the only way to life. So I thought that was really cool. But, but I was watching the movie, and, and I just confess this to you. I was sitting there, and I, and I was watching it as a critic, okay? Because I'm like, you know, checking the box going, yep, that happened. That's a pretty good way of showing that. Oh, that, nope, they got that one wrong, you know? <laughs> you know, oh, they kind of compressed that. That didn't happen there. That didn't ha- you know, so, so I'm going through kind of checking the boxes, you know, writing out my critique in my head as I'm watching it. And they get to the crucifixion. And I don't care which movie it is, Passion of the Christ or one of the other Jesus movies. Crucifixion, man, that, that's moving. That grabs you. That's hard to watch. And so I'm watching it. And, and the critic left for a little bit. And I just kind of entered into the film. And I'm watching the, the, the crucifixion of Jesus. And, and it gets to the point where he's carrying the cross out to Golgotha. And he's stumbling and he's falling. And the, the soldiers are kicking him and beating him and everything. And, and you know, you're, you're just in the moment. And they get to the place where... The soldiers compel Simon of Cyrene to carry Jesus' cross. And and that moment in the movie just captured me. Suddenly, it was no critic. It was just there. And and it was really beautiful the way they filmed it because they, they had Simon, you know, bend down and pick up the cross and he made eye contact with Jesus and, and they showed it in the film where it stopped being this burden that he was being compelled to do at the point of a Roman sword. And it was, you know, interrupting his day. And suddenly, it went from being a burden to being an honor. And I thought, man, how cool would that have been to have been the one that they made carry the cross of Jesus? You know, have his blood on your clothes and on your face and, and to help him take the cross to Calvary. And, and by the way, it, that was a life-changing event for Simon of Cyrene because uh, church tradition says that he became a, a follower of Jesus Christ and a leader in the church and that his sons are the men of Cyrene that are mentioned in Acts and in Paul's letters. It's changed his life. And then I thought, do you think it's possible, given, wor- or given Jesus' words in Luke 9, that, that Jesus doesn't want us to be compelled to carry his cross? Do you think maybe that Jesus is inviting me and you to volunteer? Instead of being dragged at the point of a spear to be made to to carry the cross, that he's waiting for you and I on the sidelines to step out of the crowd, to step out of our comfort, to step out of our complacency and say, Jesus, I volunteer to carry your cross. I will lay aside all of the pleasure, all the comfort. I I will gladly get my hands dirty for you. I will share in your pain and I will share in your mission so that I can be part of what you are doing in this world. Are we the men and women who are going to volunteer to walk with Jesus up the hill to his death so that we can share in his resurrection and in the power of his mission? Is Jesus challenging me and you to deny ourselves Embrace death and go all in to follow the Son of God. After all, he went all in to save us. 
For if anyone would be my disciple, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and come follow me. Would you pray with me? Father, thanks. Thank you for putting up with us. And thank you for saving us. We know we don't deserve your grace. We've done nothing to earn it, but you have offered it to us freely from the cross. And God, thank you tonight that the cross gets in our way. Because we want to live for you. We want to offer ourselves up to you because you have saved us. You have changed us. You have given us life and hope. And so tonight, we commit ourselves to you again, afresh and anew, thanking you for the life in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.